Can you say something to the history of alchemy? A little bit. And its impact? I, sure. Um, it used to be thought two things. One, that alchemy, which dates certainly back to the Islamic period in Islam, uh, you're talking, you know, 11th, 12th, 13th centuries uh, among Islamic natural philosophers and experimenters. Uh, but it used to be thought that um, alchemy, which picked up strikingly in the 15th, 16th century, 1500s and thereabouts, uh, was a sort of mystical procedure involving all sorts of strange notions and so on. And that's not entirely untrue. But it is substantially untrue in that alchemists were engaged in what uh, was known as chrysopoeia, that is, looking for ways to transform um, invaluable materials into valuable ones. Mm -hmm. But in the process of doing so or attempting to do so, they learned how to uh, create complex amalgams of various kinds. They used very elaborate apparatus, glass alembics, in which they would use heat to produce chemical decompositions. They would write down and observe these compositions. And many of the so-called really strange-looking alchemical formulas and statements where they'll say something like, I, I can't produce it, but it'll be, be the soul of Mars will combine with the this, yes. et cetera, et cetera. These, it has been shown, are almost all actual formulas for how to engage in the production of complex amalgams mm -hmm. and what to do. And by the time of Newton, Newton was reading the works of a uh, fellow by the name of Starkey, who was actually came from Harvard uh, uh, shortly before, in which... Um, Things had progressed, if you will, to the point where the procedure turns into what historians call chrysopoeia, which basically runs into the notion of thinking that may, these things are made out of particles. This is the mechanical philosophy. Can we engage in processes, chemical processes, to rearrange these things, which is not so stupid after all. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do it, except we happen to do it in reactors, not in chemical processes, unless, of course, it had happened that cold fusion had worked, which it didn't. Um, Not yet. Well, right. But um, so that's the way they're thinking about these things. There's a kind of mix. And Newton engages extensively in those sorts of manipulations. In fact, more in that than almost anything else, uh, except for his optical investigations. If you look through the latter parts of the 1670s, the last five, six, seven years or so of that, there's more on that than there is on anything else. He's not working on mechanics. He's pretty much gone pretty far in optics. He'll turn back to optics later on. So optics and alchemy. So what you're saying is Isaac Newton liked shiny things. Well, actually, if you go online and look at what Bill Newman, the professor at Indiana, uh, at uh, Bloomington, Indiana, has produced, you'll find the very shiny thing called the Star Regulus, which Newton describes as having produced according to a particular way, which Newman figured out and was able to do it. And it's very shiny. <laughs> there you go. Proves the theorem. <laughs>